So the Olympic spirit, it's a golden Sunday, isn't it? So you guys are the ones who stayed home in the first gathering to watch the game. God bless you. <laughs> you know, the, the Olympic spirit, and this morning is part three of this, of this series entitled The Olympic Spirit, and it's entitled The Olympic Crowds. Can you imagine with me this morning... The Olympic golden medal hockey game without any crowds, without anybody watching it in the arena, it would kind of be a little bit weird, wouldn't it? It would be a little bit counterproductive. There wouldn't be that atmosphere that goes with the Olympics. Can you imagine the Olympic uh, opening ceremonies and uh, later on today, the closing ceremonies without anybody there to watch the spectacle? It would be kind of weird and lame, wouldn't it? Can you imagine somebody's graduation, maybe your son or daughter's after a whole lot of work and nobody is there to watch them get their diploma? Just nobody, nobody to applaud, nobody to be, be like, yeah, that's my daughter. Just silence, just you and your teacher. You see, without the crowds, it's just not inspiring. It's not Dynamic. There's no energy. Sometimes, let's face it, our lives can feel a little bit like we're playing this game called life. We're running this race, and we wonder at times, does anybody even know we're in the game? Is anybody cheering us on? The reality is there are many that cheer us on. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 speak about the many who cheer us on. The author of Hebrews says that there is a cloud of witnesses that cheer us on in life. Who's in this cloud of witnesses, you might ask this morning? Well, Hebrews 11 and 12 tell us who the cloud is and who's in the cloud of witnesses who are watching us, who are inspiring us, who are encouraging us to run this race that has been set out before us. Hebrews 11 tells us a whole slew of individuals Biblical ancestors, biblical characters who have gone before us and lived faith-filled life that in many a ways echoes through history into our life today saying, come on, Joel, be a man of faith. Be a father who exemplifies to his kids that you're a faith-filled man. Be a faithful husband. Be a faith-filled pastor. As we look into the cloud of witnesses in the crowds this morning, maybe one of the first individuals we, look, we see and notice is Noah. Oh yes, good old Noah. Noah was known as being a, a righteous man, a man of God. In fact, it was Noah. And you'll find his story in Genesis 6 and 7. He was warned about something he couldn't see. And he acted on what he was told. He was warned about something he couldn't see. He couldn't see the storm that was looming, the floods that were about to come. But all he knew was God told him, Noah, you got to build an ark. You got to build a ship. And I know it's in the middle of the desert. And I know you're in drought. And you haven't seen rain for a long time. But trust me on this, Noah. Because my people have become so corrupt, I'm going to wipe the earth of everything I've created. But you, Noah, you're a righteous man and your family is going to be blessed because of your righteousness. I want you to begin to build the ship. Because it's in that ship where you and your family and, and, and pairs of animals will be rescued from this flood. Now put yourself in Noah's predicament. What would you say? What would you do? It would have been easy to say, God, I mean... I, you know how much abuse I'm going to hear from the neighbors building a boat because there's going to be floodwaters? You can only imagine what they're going to say to me. But the scriptures say that over and over again that Noah did what God said. Noah did what God said. Noah followed through with what God commanded because he was a man of faith that though he couldn't see it yet, he trusted in God's word. What God said mattered to him, and it activated his faith. So he went out there day in and day out, 
and built the ark that God had told them to build. And the story goes that the flood waters came 40 days, 40 nights. And there was so much rain that the highest mountain was approximately 20 feet underwater. And the word says that 150 days went by as Noah and his family are out there in the water. And then in Genesis 8, 1, it says, but God remembered Noah. He's a man of faith, isn't he? Didn't seem like it was a reasonable idea to build an ark, but if God says something, you do it. And Noah's out there in the stands, in the crowd of witnesses in your life. And he's saying, look at my life. You see what I did? I believed God in faith and look at what happened. My entire family and the human family was able to restart because I believed in what God told me to do. There are moments in your life and in mine where God says, I need you to do this. I need you to take this step of faith. Though you can't see what will transpire after, trust me. Have faith in me. So there's Noah this morning. He's inspiring us. He's in the cloud of witnesses. If we look around in the, in the crowds, we find also a man named Abraham. Ah, yes, Abraham. What a man of God. The scriptures teach us that Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. He's got he's settled. He's got his livestock. He's got his family. He likes where he lives. And God says, hey, Abraham, I need you to move to a foreign land because I've got something even better for you. In fact, I'm going to use you and your family and the, every descendants that follow will be blessed because of you. It would have been easy for Abraham to say, you know what, I'm quite comfortable where I am. Thank you, God. To, to pack up my bags and, and go to a foreign land with my family. I don't know what it's going to be like there. I don't have relationships there. I don't know what the business is going to be like there. Well, how is that going to work out? No. Abraham packs his bags and does what God asks him to do. Because he was a man of faith. He trusted that when God led you somewhere, that was the safest place on earth for him to be. You see, God's will, being in the center of God's will is the safest place on earth for us to be. And some of you know exactly what Abraham went through. You migrated into this country of Canada and you took a massive risk and you settled in a foreign land and you know that all that goes with that. Missing a home and, and, and trying to renew uh, or make new friendships and, and getting used to a totally different culture and a totally different climate. It's not easy but like Abraham you took the step of faith because you believed God was leading you and because Abraham took that step of faith we're blessed so Abraham today is standing in the cloud of witnesses and he's saying to you come on I know sometimes it's risky I know sometimes it feels foreign I know sometimes I call you God calls you to do uh, put yourself in, in foreign situations and circumstances, but trust him and watch what he does. There's Abraham. He's cheering you on today. And maybe right beside Abraham is his wife, Sarah. Sarah was an amazing lady. She was inspiring. Genesis 10 and 21, it speaks to us about how she believed the one who made a promise would do what he said he would do. You see, God said, I'm going to bless all descendants through your life. I mean, Abraham wavered in his faith at times. In fact, one day he says, God, you know, how are you going to do that? My wife is barren. She doesn't even have a child. How, are, how is this inheritance going to happen? How are descendants going to be blessed? God took him outside. It was nighttime. He showed him all the stars in the sky. And he said, can you see all the stars up there? Your descendants will be blessed beyond the number of stars in the sky. Trust me, Abraham. Sarah believed in the promise that God had given to her. And when it was almost humanly possible because she, she, she got old, 
She believed that God had promised something and she believed it to the very end. And when it was almost humanly impossible for her to have a child, she conceived and gave birth to Isaac. That was the beginning of the many descendants that have been blessed from that day on. But boy, I'm sure they had some days wondering, God, is this true? Are you really going to make this happen? You promised it. But they plowed through. In fact, in Hebrews 11, there's Sarah, part of the cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on. And sometimes God has planted dreams and hopes and promises in your life. Don't ever lose sight of those promises. Be a man, a woman, a student, a child of faith to believe that God is the God who fulfills promises. Sarah's there and she's cheering you on. She's cheering you on. Maybe as we scan the audience a little more, we discover a couple, Moses' parents. This couple's amazing. Their story is found in Exodus chapter 2. See, they saw this child's beauty and they braved the king's decree. I mean, remember with me their story. The Israelites were growing. They're in slavery in Egypt. The Egyptians aren't liking the fact that their families are growing and multiplying and they're getting a little bit fearful that they're getting bigger than the Egyptian population and so they're scared that they're going to turn on them and so the leader of the day sends down an edict and says, I want every baby boy to be killed. He tells the midwives, when you give birth, when you help uh, these moms give birth to, and, and they have baby boys, I want you to make sure you kill them. Well, of course, the midwives were godly people and they wouldn't let that happen. And it was during this volatile situation where Moses' parents, Moses' mom gives birth to a baby boy. And they look at him and he's so beautiful and he's so healthy. And they think to themselves, God, what do you have for my son in the midst of this volatile season of our history? What's going to happen? Is he going to be murdered? So they hide him for the first few months, but hey, babies grow. And so they can't hide him anymore. He's starting to get loud and move around. And, and so his mom thinks of an idea. She gets a basket and she puts tar around it and she puts Moses in the basket and she puts him down the river. Now stop right there. That, that is enormous amount of faith to say, God, this is my kid and I love him. I can't hide him anymore. I believe you've got a plan for his life. I'm trusting you with him. You ever feel like that sometimes about your own kids? It's hard, isn't it? You try to, you try to, to raise him up the best way you can. You're not perfect. You've made blunders along the way. Sometimes you just got to trust God with them. Have faith to believe that God will lead them. And it turns out that as this basket flows down the river, Pharaoh's daughter, I mean, what are the chances? She's down by the river bathing and she sees this basket and goes, calls one of her servants, go, what's in that basket? They realize it's a baby. She falls in love with this little baby and takes Moses home. Next thing you know, Moses grows up in palace lifestyle. <laughs> you see that? A mother believed in faith. And that boy went from being in a basket, not knowing where the end would be, into the palace lifestyle. Moses' parents showed a lot of faith, didn't they? And there they are in the stands of your life saying, come on, don't get yourself so discouraged that you quit. Trust the God who gave you that child. Maybe... As we scan the audience, not only do we find Moses' parents, but now we, saw, we see Moses himself. You see, Moses grew up in this palace lifestyle, as I said, but Moses chose a hard life with God's people rather than an opportunistic soft life of sin with the oppressors. You see, Moses grew up in this palace lifestyle. He had everything you could have ever hoped for. The best food, the best education, the best lifestyle. He had it. But he was a Hebrew. And his Egyptian foster parents were horrible oppressors to the Hebrew people. 
The Hebrew people were their slaves. They worked long hours building bricks and with straw in the heat of the day and they, they were oppressing them. And one day Moses left the palace and he thought to himself, let me go see how my Hebrew brothers and sisters are doing. And as he goes out there, he sees something horrifying. He sees that one of the Hebrew men are being brutally abused and mistreated. And something in Moses snaps, literally. A holy discontent to the point where he murders the Egyptian who is mistreating the Hebrew. Moses would regret that move. But something started to spark in Moses' life. He left the palace lifestyle so that he could lead the Hebrew people. Now, he was kind of resistant. When God was calling him to lead, he came up with every excuse in the book. I don't know how to speak. I'm not a good leader. You're calling the wrong guy. But in the end, he leads the people. But ultimately, Moses left the posh lifestyle to work with the slaves. I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like a man filled with faith. A man who chooses the harder path rather than the easy path. Sometimes God calls us. Though the culture might be going this way, though the path might be wide, and though it might seem better, take the narrow one. Trust me as you take it. Moses did that. And he's out there in the stands of our lives, in the, cl in the crowds of people saying, come on, don't take the easy path, students. You see, other students might be going this way. Take the harder path. Trust God. Do it God's way and see how he'll bless you. Moses is out there cheering us on. In fact, maybe Moses has a whole section in the crowd. It's him and all the Israelites. And the Israelites, hey, they, they weren't always faith-filled, right? If you know the biblical account. I mean, they grumbled. They complained. They, they had faith for a little bit and then they were faithless. Sounds a little bit like us. In fact, after Moses was leading them for a while and the Lord began to bring all kinds of plagues to Pharaoh and his people because of how they were treating the Israelites, finally Pharaoh says, okay, get lost, get rid of these Israelites, they're causing, uh, their God's causing so much turmoil in our land, let them go, fine, go. And so Moses starts to lead them towards the promised land and as they're leaving Egyptian territory, Pharaoh has a change of heart. He said, like, wait a minute, what did we just do? We just got rid of all of our workforce. No, that means we got to do it. No, 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 get back in your chariots. Let's go after them and get them back. The Israelites are going on their way. They turn around and they see Pharaoh and all his chariots coming after them. They're thinking, oh my Lord. In fact, they look at Moses and they say, what did you do to us? What, did you bring us out here to die in the middle of nowhere? We might as well have stayed in Egypt. You see, sometimes... Journeying towards God's best has these moments of, oh man, what's going to happen here? You ever feel that in life? It's not always nice, neat, and tidy, is it? But it's in those very moments where you think, oh man, did I make a mistake? God, can I really trust you because it doesn't look very good? Look behind us, Pharaoh and his chariots are coming after us, and there's a sea in front of us, we're trapped. And it was in that very moment where God says to Moses, get that hand over the, get that rod over that water and watch what I do. And he does it. And God sends this wind and he puts one side of the, of the, of the waves on one end and the other on the other. And there's this dry piece of land down the middle of the sea and they begin to walk down dry ground. I mean, you can only imagine these Israelites are walking on dry ground, but there's walls of water beside them. They've got their little kids feel a little bit intimidating, couldn't it? And they're walking, and I'm sure they're saying, oh God, I'm you are amazing. God, I can't believe how you've just put these waves up straight up, 90 degree angle, and we're walking on dry ground that was a few minutes filled with water. And as they're going across, of course, as the story says, the Egyptians run after them, but God brings in the waters once the Israelites get on the other side, and the entire Egyptian army gets wiped out. The Israelites trusted that those waves would stay on either side and they walked across dry ground. It wasn't easy. They wavered in their faith. They, they weren't perfect in their faith journey. 
But at the end of the day, they trust it. They trust it. Friends, you've got an entire Israelite community who's standing in the sidelines of your life saying, don't underestimate the power of God when it seems like there's no way out of this thing. Trust Him. He's the one who split the sea into assuredly. He can help you in your circumstance and in your situation. They're spurring you on. Can you hear them today? The cloud of witnesses. We can go on and on, biblical ancestor after biblical ancestor, as Hebrews 11 states for us. Hebrews 12 then begins with these words. After this whole list of men and women of faith, this hall of faith, the author of Hebrews says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering you on, it means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, never quit, no extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Sometimes we get so easily entangled and our faith wavers so easily. And, and sometimes it's moments like this where God says, come on, get rid of those sin issues in your life. Start getting discouraged and start believing in a God who can make a way for you. The crowd is cheering you on. These pioneers are, keep your eyes on Jesus, the Hebrew author says, who both began and finished this race we're in. You see, study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way, whether it was cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, anybody sometimes flag in their faith? Lord, I think I'm about to give up. Go over that story again. Item by item, that long litany of hostility that Jesus plowed through, that will shoot your adrenaline into your souls. Think of Jesus today. Yes, we get spurred on by these pioneers, these biblical ancestors, but we worship only one. We worship Jesus. He's the one who battled through to the point of his death. He's the one who battled through denial, betrayal, homelessness. The Son of God, nowhere to lay his hand but on a rock. To the point of death and shame. And yet he came out victorious. And so, friend, you go through difficult circumstance, Jesus knows. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. And as you do that, you will be inspired and motivated not to flag in your faith, but to trust in the God who is the author and the finisher of your life. He won't let you go. He won't abandon you today. And so we have the biblical ancestors cheering us on, in particular, Jesus himself. Secondly, we have the roar of our family and friends that cheer us on. Maybe you can think of individuals in your life that have really inspired you. They lived a life of faith. They exemplify to you how to work through challenges in life. And you're here today in many ways because of their inspiration and their example. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is found in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 1, 5 to 7. And it's... The Apostle Paul writing to a young leader, his name is Timothy, and he tells Timothy something so profound. He says this to him. We can have the text on the screen. I have been reminded of your sincere faith. So Paul's saying to Timothy, you have a sincere faith, young Timothy. I see it in you, the way you live your life, the way you lead, the way you pastor people. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother. You know, Lois, your grandmother. And in your mother, Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you as well. Isn't that powerful? 
See, Timothy wasn't just somebody who built his faith by himself. No, no, there was a lineage in his life of women of faith specific to his life, a grandmother and a mother who showed him what it was to be like to live a life of faith. goes on to say, I've, been, I've read that. For this reason, I remind you, Timothy, because of your lineage, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Timothy, your grandma and your mother, they were powerful women. They believed in faith in a God that was much bigger than them. And they, their faith has seeped into your life. Don't let it grow dim in your life, but fan it into flame because I've given you a spirit not of timidity, not of fear, but of power, of love, and self-discipline. Now live the life of faith that your family members have left for you to live. You know, as I read that passage, I was so inspired by it. And I couldn't help but think of some of the people in my life that have inspired me. My grandma, my father's mom. You can see a, an image come up on the screen there. There she is. My nonna is how we say it in Italian. My grandma and my grandpa, these were amazing people. But in particular, my grandma was a woman of faith. It was 1944, in the middle of World War II, in a town of Fondi, Italy. And it was a terrible time. They had, to, they had to relocate from their own town simply because of the volatility in that area. My grandpa was out in war. They didn't even know if he was still alive. And for years, he had been gone from the home. And my grandma was left with her little guy, eight-year-old Mario, my father. It had gone about two days without any food. They couldn't get any food. And they, she remembers going into this gymnasium where there was a long lineup of people just to get a little bit of bread. And of course, eight-year-old Mario, he wasn't sitting nice and quiet. He was kind of getting antsy. He hadn't eaten for two days, for goodness sake. He was making some noise. He was crying. And grandma tells the story of a fascist soldier that comes up to her and puts the barrel of his gun right in her face and says, you better shut your son up before I kill you and him. This woman of faith looked him in the eye and said, my God is bigger. Grabbed her son and walked out. And as she walks out, she's saying, God, you're going to have to provide for my family. You're going to have to make a way for, for my son here. And I don't even know where my husband, if he's even alive. But God, we're trusting in you. And of, course, of course, the good God provided for every need. And as Mario became a teenager, he was a little bit of a spark plug and got himself in a little bit of trouble. But my dad remembers seeing Grandma on her knees by the bathtub in the washroom praying for her teenage son over and over and over again until he was 16 and he said yes to Jesus. That moment he said yes to Jesus, he had this compelling desire to share the gospel to others. And that is what he did. He started preaching soon after. At the age of 18, he was pastoring a church. And he's been preaching ever since 50 plus years later. And it's interesting to me to think that now he has grown three kids himself. One standing in front of you today. Another one planting churches all over Europe. And another one who's raised some amazing kids who are doing great exploits for the kingdom. But I can't help but think of Nona. And the spirit and the faith that she had. I wonder where would we be if it wasn't for her faith. You might sit here and you might say, I don't have that kind of lineage, Pastor. Yeah, well, it started with somebody. 
It started with that lady in my family. Can it not start with you? Maybe God has positioned you in your family tree at such, for such a time as this to start a lineage of men and women of faith who believe for a better day, a better tomorrow. For some of you, you've had an amazing lineage. You've had some amazing people in your family or friends that have showed you the way. May you be inspired by their lives. Sometimes we get easily tangled and we forget about our heritage. And we've got some amazing mature adults even in our congregation. Friends, we don't just want to be the kind of church that's a young church. We want to be an intergenerational church. Because there's some godly mature adults in our, in our church who have paved the way and we're here today because of their faith. You got family. You got friends that are cheering you on. Don't get distracted by parasitic sins or doubts or questions that deter you from living a life that is worthy of God's calling on your life. Run, run, and be that man and that woman of faith that has been exemplified for you by others. And finally this morning, the roar of our own lives. What kind of life are we living? You see, I found it interesting that at the last two verses of chapter 11, after this whole list of men and women of faith, you know what it says? It says this, not one of these people, even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised. It wasn't that they got everything. It wasn't that they got it right all the time. You see, my grandmother, she died in her 60s of cancer. But she died a woman of faith. She died a woman that couldn't wait to see her Jesus in heaven. And today she's standing with a perfect glorified body cheering us on. And one day we will be reunited with Nonna. You see, we live for another day. We live for another place. The question is, what kind of legacy are we leaving behind? You see, not one of these people, even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised, God had a better plan for us. That their faith and our faith would come together to make one completed whole. Their lives of faith not complete apart from ours. So what's the author saying? He's saying the story isn't over because your story still needs to be written. Their stories, including our stories, make the whole story. So the question becomes, what kind of story are you writing? What kind of story of faith are you writing? Because the story of God is not over. It includes yours. I conclude with this illustration. True story about a white Zambian farmer who moved his family to South Africa for a, a better day. His desire was to plant an amazing crop of potatoes. But as he landed, the scientists of, of, of South Africa told him, you better not plan on planting any potatoes here because there is major drought and if you don't have any irrigation in place, this is not going to work for you. But he believed that God had called him. It's the true story of a man named Angus Buchan. There's a whole movie that has been filmed, a biography of his life. But friend, it wasn't an easy journey for him and his family. They did go through drought. They did go through wildfires, but they believed a God who can overcome the challenges of their life. Here's a depiction of what faith looks like. Show the clip. Okay. 
Sarah, I've got to go back into town, man. Let me get the doctor. No! We've got to put the fire out first. OK, where can I help? Start here. The line match plantation. They'll sue me. Get it. Get it out. OK, hold on. Simeon! Simeon! Simeon, come on! you desire when you pray believe that you shall receive them and you shall have them what things ever you desire when you pray believe that you shall receive them and you shall have them Simeon Alitana Zela Vula Manje Vula Manje Vula Manje Vula Manje Vula Manje Vula Manje Alitana Zela Vula Manje I do want a man to fall. I'll get to us in shop. Jesus Christ. life ever feel a little bit like that? Where it's like, God, we feel like we're fighting fires all the time. Is there any way out of this thing? Friend, it's in those very moments where God says, show me your faith. Can you just show me you believe in me? Trust me. Trust me to send the rain when you need it. Trust me to send a friend when you need him most. Trust me. Trust me. As I was preparing this message, I think there's a moment here, and in our first gathering, something powerful happened. God came down and touched people's lives. People who were down and out and ready to quit on life were inspired by the scriptures. And I am believing for that in this gathering. What is it that you're bringing to Jesus today? You maybe have wavered in your faith. But today, you can take the step of faith. And say, no, I'm going to trust him. Whatever the outcome, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to trust you with my kids. I'm going to trust you with my family. I'm going to trust you with my health. I'm going to trust you with my resources and my finances. I'm going to trust you with my job. I'm going to stop getting tangled up and defeated, but I'm going to trust you in the midst of my storm. Listen, even as a church, God's asking us, do you trust me? God is on the brink of, of wanting us to take a massive step of faith. And you'll hear more and more about it as we come to our annual business meeting. Are we going to believe in him in faith? 